Oliver was in his third year at the Food Industry Institute when his mother became seriously ill. His father left the family when Oliver was three years old. For the first couple months after the divorce, his father paid child support faithfully and then as if in the water vanished. He and his mother haven't heard from him since. Natalie tried to track him down and then gave up. God be his judge, the woman said. The few relatives they had didn't have much money, but they had enough problems of their own. Savings were running out, and finally Oliver told his mother that he was transferring to a correspondence course. I'll get a job, he said. What else is there to do? It's going to be hard for you, Natalie sighed. No harder than it will be for you, answered the son. You've been pulling me along for so many years and now it's my turn. Tears welled up in the sick woman's eyes. Jesus, he's all grown up, she thought. Mom, why are you sick? Oliver was scared. No. Natalie shook her head with a smile. On the contrary, I feel very good. Oliver was ready for any job, even the hardest and dirtiest. But he'd been lucky enough to get a job as a waiter in a rather prestigious restaurant. Our hostess respects part-time students, said the hiring manager. Mia started working in this field herself when she was a student, and so did I. So you're our man. Welcome to the team. Well, it was an encouraging start. The job wasn't easy. Shifts started at 10 hour in the morning and ended at 10 hour at night. If there was a banquet at the restaurant, the shift could go past midnight. At the end of the shift, my legs were killing me, and my head was spinning. But the tips were excellent. Besides, the staff were fed breakfast, lunch, dinner, and taken home. Anyway, Oliver needed this job. The main task was to cure his mother and at the same time not starve to death. The room was full, and Oliver had no time to sit down. He was serving three tables, and the customers at one of them demanded special attention. Oliver went out of his way to bring them more vodka, fresh water for their hands, and napkins. Having worked in the restaurant for a week and a half, he'd already realized that if he could get a tip from such customers, it would be pennies. But it's a lot of work. The whole shift had left for dinner 20 minutes ago, and he was the only one running around. His stomach was clearly suggesting that it would be a good idea to join the rest of the staff, but the customers wouldn't stop. Finally, the customers, leaving Oliver a modest tip as he'd intended, left the restaurant, and the guy went into the kitchen. He exhaled, sinking down on the table. They got you. With sympathy, said the chef Jack, giving Oliver a generous portion of mashed potatoes and chops. That's all right, eat up and get your strength back. There are five more tables waiting for you. No, he groaned, taking his dinner in the kitchen. Bartender David walked in. What he'd done had shaken Oliver to the core. David was developing underdrawn drinks into bottles, paying no attention to the labels. Oliver pictured an elegant lady who knew a lot about fine wines, and so she wished to treat herself to a good wine if she was served an unthinkable mixture of vermouth, vodka, cognac with a purely symbolic amount of wine. It was hard to even imagine how this lady would react to such an intricate cocktail. And then he imagined someone's birthday party. Yeah, what's that? People come to the restaurant to have a cultural rest and enjoy good food and quality drinks. And it turns out they've been drinking whatever the hell they're drinking. So much for the prestigious restaurant. What are you guys doing? Oliver was horrified. People are going to get instantly intoxicated from the Northern Lights. What if they vomit or, God forbid, get alcohol poisoning? So be it. David shrugged indifferently, continuing to manipulate the drinks. A drunken client is a promising client, but you go and see for yourself that drunks tip more than sober ones. Come on, they told you to bring fortified wine, so bring him this horrible mixture. If they ask for a cocktail, you get the same thing, but don't forget to add ice. When a man's drunk enough, he won't know what he's getting. You see the bottles on the top shelf. There are nurturers. Oliver shook his head. He felt uncomfortable, honestly, as if he'd been fed this stuff. But the bartender, as if not noticing his expression, continued. We use that kind of thing all the time, and we pocket the money for this infernal mixture. Pay attention, student. If you pay with a card, then, of course, more difficult. But we found a way out of it. I'll tell you about it later. David winked at Oliver and set down the filled bottle, which was indeed filled with a dozen different containers of disgusting liquor. He went behind the bar. It's wild. He shook his head and looked at Jack hoping that he would support him. 
but the chef just chuckled. Don't worry about it, he said. It's only a bit of a pain at first, and then, when you get used to it, it'll be all right. Yeah, I guess so, Oliver muttered. Frankly, he wasn't sure he'd be, as Jack had said, even. A few days later, Oliver saw Jack trimming a chop that someone had eaten, then reheating it, and dressed it with a delicious mix of tomatoes, chili, sweet peppers, broccoli, and parsley. And then Jack topped the chop with the remains of someone else's garnish. There, he said with satisfaction. It's beautiful. No one would ever guess. It did look like the cover of a cooking magazine. If Oliver hadn't known it was a trick, he would have tasted it and asked for more. He looked at the chef judgmentally. Oliver, don't give me that look. Yes, food is used in the same way as alcoholic beverages. So what? It's money, real money. What does a customer do with a fork and a salad if he doesn't like the dish or if he's full? Ah, the order was made, so to speak, for solidity. That's good for us. Taken away and stuck in the refrigerator to wait for the star hour conveniently. That's right, chuckled Mary the cook. Especially if the food is top-notch. Then it's likely that someone will choose it more, and we will decorate it spectacularly and put it on the table. Beautiful. Oliver, relax. I don't get it. Do you want the money or what? Jack laughed. The answer was obvious, but Oliver was, to put it bluntly, shocked. He didn't understand it. Why don't you eat it all yourself? Oliver asked with a mirthful chuckle, and the cooks laughed. I've got an idea, Jack said, laughing. What if some infectious disease took a bite? So you don't care about other people? Absolutely, assured the chef from the top of his lungs. Personally, I do not baptize children with them. Besides, the restaurant's customers are not poor people, and medicine is now at its best. They'll be cured. That's terrible, Oliver exclaimed. But we carry bags of fresh food home. Don't tell me you don't like it too, Mary said. The boy had no answer. What can I say? Without this job, and therefore the opportunity to carry home groceries, he and his mother would have been starving. But as it was, they ate ham, salmon, cheese, and other goodies almost every day. It's no big deal. You get used to good things quickly, but we don't know what would have happened to mom. It's quite possible that she wouldn't be alive anymore. After all, this work allowed not only to eat good food, but also to buy not cheap medicines, and of course not to offend the nurse. So what if Natalie was being looked after by a neighbor? Aunt Kate is a retired nurse. She'd refuse to pay for her services, but the man was wasting his time. So Oliver felt obliged to do something to encourage this kind woman, who was no stranger to self-interest, and he found a way to do it. The guy brought from the restaurant not only cheeses and sausages, but also delicious sweets, fruits, pastries, and the women were happy to have tea. The cakes and pastries and other outlandish desserts looked like the truest works of art. And the women said that it was a pity to eat them. Go ahead and eat them, he said to his mother and neighbor laughing. I'll bring you more later. His mother smiled with gratitude and pride. And for Oliver, it was the best reward of all. And if he quit the restaurant, none of this would ever happen again. And since that was the case, Oliver had no choice but to be patient and accept it. So the guy patiently listened to the lecture for especially honest employees, during which he learned that the 200 gram kebab was made a quarter less. No one knows what they pay for 150 grams of kebab, Jack bragged. More vegetables and more onion sauce, and the portion seems big. Down, 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 Oliver thought. It would be something to be proud of. The potatoes and cereals here had been ruthlessly economized. No one would weigh them. The oil was changed after freeing potatoes or pies only when the food started to look unattractive. The savings are tangible, and this is not the limit. What to say? The staff of the restaurant Medea worked harmoniously one for all and all for one. Circle vice be damned. But no matter how much you sneer, there was no choice. Apparently, it's true what people say, that money doesn't smell. After a long, hard shift, Oliver stopped by to see his mother. Do you want breakfast? She asked with a kind smile. Aunt Kate made cheesecakes that melt in your mouth. And if with raspberry jam, it's a gourmet's dream. What's he got to do with cheesecakes? She invented cheesecakes. The neighbor was also embarrassed. He now probably only recognizes restaurant food. Restaurant food? Oliver grinned wryly. You should know what kind of food that is. He told his mother and his neighbor what he'd seen in the restaurant kitchen. 
Oh my God, what a nightmare, Natalie gasped. Yeah, Kate said slowly. No more eating places. Maybe a pizza place. And even then, how could they guarantee that they wouldn't put used sausage on the pizza? That's terrible. That's a real crime. But Oliver and I don't go out to eat. I used to take him to the ice cream parlor and that was it. But I'm definitely not going there anymore. Well, you're a great cook, smiled the neighbor. I remember my Sam, God rest his soul, praising your cold cakes. I can't do that. I've done everything you said, but I can't do it. I can't do it. But your cheesecakes, I can swallow my tongue. Natalie smiled back. Mom, you intrigue me? I think I'll have breakfast, Oliver laughed. I think the best food is home cooked. You can buy wine or beer at the store. But who knows what the manufacturer can do? Everyone wants to grab a fatter piece of food, Natalie sighed. It doesn't matter how. I think it's the same abroad, Kate replied. Although, you know, there are decent restaurants too. I remember that my colleagues and I celebrated Medical Day in Hamlet and sat on the summer veranda. We chose grilled fish and, imagine, they brought it raw and cooked it right behind our backs. But that's definitely not about Medea, the guy chuckled. And they brewed coffee in front of the customers too. The neighbor continued to share her impressions. Bean's little machine, which in front of us on the counter was standing, and then brewed. So if you want to have a hearty rest only, Hamlet. True, it's a bit expensive, but it's worth it. We'll know, Oliver said and went to the kitchen. The next day was a day off. And when Oliver went to work, the receptionist Molly came to him and said that the boss told him to come in. Hello, he said, frantically remembering the name of the owner of the restaurant. Mia, I think. Lady Boss turned out to be a well-groomed, slightly overweight blonde with expressive facial features. Mia's ears, neck, fingers, and wrists were covered with gold, which clearly hinted at her lack of taste and her tendency to flaunt her wealth. Hello? She nodded. Your name is Oliver, isn't it? Yes. Mia, the supplier called, the receptionist said. And Oliver was glad he hadn't gotten the boss's name wrong. He hated faceless people. You tell her I'll call back later, the receptionist replied, pointing to the chair opposite her. Oliver, how do you like working here? Fine, the guy answered evasively. Yes, Mia asked him again and looked at him carefully. Maybe there are some wishes. Oliver wondered if the hostess knew about the chef and bartender's trickery. He had never been a snitch, sincerely believing it to be an abominable low snitch first whip. Oliver was 200% in agreement with that statement. Yes, but we're talking about people's health or even lives, he thought, feeling a prick of conscience. And the fact that no one had been poisoned by the foul liquor so far was luck and nothing more, as long as the rope lasted. Still, Oliver was inclined to keep his mouth shut. He was a team player and a tipper, by the way. Mary was right about the groceries, not to mention his sick mom. She was the one he was trying to break himself for. While Oliver tried to settle his conscience, an unsuspecting Mia came to the rescue. It's come to my attention that you're not happy with the kitchen and bar, she said. Why should I be satisfied or dissatisfied with it? Oliver grumbled. So be it. She wouldn't talk about anything. Silence is golden, whereas talking could cost him his job. I'm not a client. That's right. Not a client. Mia nodded with a smile. Oliver, I'm a straight shooter, and I prefer to speak without offense. I'm aware that the bartender mixes drinks left over from customers, and the chef serves dishes made from leftovers. He looked at his boss in amazement, but she continued as if nothing had happened. What I don't understand is what you see so criminal about it. It's our custom. What's wrong with it? I'll make a profit, and you'll get a bonus to your salary. But it's not fair. Honestly, it's not fair, Mia said with a sigh. Everything in life is unfair, or almost everything. You're still young and don't understand a lot of things. Besides, you're a new person. Do you want my advice? Don't think about it. It'll be easier that way. What's the bottom line? Revenues are stable and even increasing. The clientele is happy because our chef is a master chef. By the way, we should give Jack an extra bonus and you'll be all set. But the lure has begun. Oliver grinned mentally. Though he didn't really care about laughing, it would be funny if it weren't so sad. If you play by our rules, of course, Lady Boss said with a meaningful look. To live with the wolves is to howl with the wolves. A very good saying, I'll tell you. I guess there's nothing else to do, Oliver thought doomedly. 
Well, I hear you, he replied. I hope so, Mia said with a nod. You're not getting any bonus products yet. Am I understanding this correctly? What bonus products? So they don't, the hostess said. Bonus products are a ready-made business lunch or a romantic dinner with home delivery. Do you have a girlfriend? No, I haven't. He shook his head and involuntarily smiled, thinking the hostess is a normal aunt. If it weren't for this one, no, it will be. Encouragingly, said Mia, how old are you? And if you don't want a romantic dinner, you can order a birthday or New Year's table. I'll make the arrangements. Thank you. Scolding himself for his indecision, Oliver replied. Well, that's it then. Go, work, and don't take everything to heart. No one will appreciate it anyway, summed up the boss, and he went to work. Oliver worked diligently and honestly tried to follow Mia's advice not to take what was happening in the restaurant to heart. But every day he was getting worse and worse at it. His co-workers jeered at him. Oliver, you'll be honest but poor, they said. We'll see about that, he thought. True, Oliver had no idea how it would be. But his intuition told him it would. Oliver had noticed a pleasant older man with a good-natured, slightly ironic smile in the restaurant. He probably liked to have fun and eat well, didn't he? He thought of the visitor with sincere sympathy. The man invariably sat down at a table near the window, ordered cinnamon coffee and pancakes stuffed with minced chicken. It seemed that there were no other dishes for him. The waiters kept asking the man to try other dishes, but he politely declined. Thank you. But some other time. However, there were many other times. The contents of the order remained the same. Oliver had served this man many times and had done so with great pleasure. The reason for this was not only the generous tips, but also the inexplicable waves of positivity from the customers. And Oliver felt good to be around him. It sounded a little strange, but it was. Oliver set the table for his regular guest and, wishing him a pleasant appetite, headed for the kitchen. Young man, wait. A customer stopped him. What's wrong? Oliver inquired. Everything's fine. If you'd be so kind as to sit down. I need to talk to you. The guy was visibly shaken and thought maybe this guy was a checker. Oh, sure, yeah, sure. Why didn't I notice it right away? He comes in almost every day and he's obviously sniffing around. Well, that's a good impression. Don't be afraid of me. I don't bite, laughed the customer. I'm not afraid, Oliver shrugged, pulling himself together. It's just that we're not allowed to sit with customers. I'm sorry. You're the one who's sorry the man said good-naturedly. Then stay close to me. I'll hold it for a while. I hear you don't like the way things are done here? Well, that's an inspector. I wonder where from. God has not blessed me with observation, he smiled. And in this connection, I have a business proposition for you. You, I see, are a man of promptness, well-mannered, and your speech is competent. And I appreciate honesty. And you seem to have it all right. That's the kind of person I need. Anyway, Here's my card. Think about it. Give me a call. The man discreetly handed Oliver his card, and he quickly slipped it into the pocket of his uniform shirt. Oliver, your lunch, Mary said, nodding at a plate of flavorful gazpacho and a basket with still warm buns. Don't worry, there are no surprises here. Oliver sighed. Ever since the day he'd snubbed the bartender and the chef, co-workers hadn't missed a chance to take a jab at him. He didn't know that David and Jack had called him a clean cut, but that was just the way he was, and he wouldn't be any different. It was enough that Oliver accepted the rules of the game and never tried to challenge them again. Do you want sandwiches? Mary said, nodding at the plate of flavored gazpacho. Mary offered and, smiling charmingly at him, reported back. There are with cheese, black caviar, ham, tomatoes. I can make it with ham. I'll have ham, he said. I'll have cheese too. Do you want butter on it? She murmured. No, thank you. The cook put a plate of sandwiches in front of Oliver and went to the stove where the chops were frying. The boy grinned. Mary clearly had her eye on him. But Oliver pretended not to notice her flirtatious intonations and the frivolously stretched top three or four buttons of her uniform blouse. Mary was, of course, a pretty well-groomed girl, but frankly, not his type at all. By the way, the bartender David liked her very much. Such a love triangle, one of the tops of which was unwittingly Oliver. The gazpacho was amazing, and under soft, crispy appetizer rolls it seemed to be the food of the gods. Having finished the cold soup, 
Oliver poured himself his favorite cappuccino from the machine and began to eat his sandwiches. How delicious. Once again, he thought. Mary had decorated the sandwiches with lettuce leaves, olives, and herbs. They were twice as good to eat. It was just a pity that people who knew their business well had no moral and ethical principles. By the way, that was another reason why Oliver couldn't reciprocate the cook's feelings. When he thanked Mary and left the kitchen, there were two tables waiting for him. So Oliver had a very timely refreshment. It had been a busy day at work. But fortunately, not too long. He was home by half past 11. Natalie was awake. You're early today, she noticed. Nodded his son and suddenly remembered the business card in the pocket of his uniform, which the restaurant employees left at work, only to be taken home when they got dirty. The uniform shirt was clean and ironed, so it rested in the closet of the room where the staff changed. A shame. A shame. Otherwise, he would have typed the name of a possible employer on the internet and learned something about him. What if the offer turned out to be a chance to get out of this shithole? Well, we'll wait till tomorrow, Oliver thought with a sigh. You look a little pensive, Natalie said. Did something happen? Something's wrong. It's no big deal. Maybe it's the opposite. I'm intrigued. His mother smiled, and Oliver told her about the conversation with the visitor. Too bad I left my business card in my uniform shirt. He waved his hands. Anyway, he had to go to work tomorrow. And this guy might come back. But do you think it's a worthwhile proposition? I don't know, he sighed. I'd like to hope so. But I can't play by their rules. No matter how many times I try to accept it, it just doesn't work. Natalie looked at her son sympathetically. It's because of me that you have to put up with this mess, she said sadly. Mom, what are you talking about? Oliver objected and hugged her. We'll get through this. You know, I feel like the offer has merit. God willing. All right, I'm going to bed. Good night. He yawned. Oliver went to bed, but despite his fatigue, he was asleep. He pulled out his smartphone and typed in the city's eateries into the search engine. But what good would that do? Oliver didn't know the name of the place where this mysterious visitor offered him to work, or at least its status. And what good would it do? On the websites of cafes, bars, and restaurants, the list of employees is not usually published. This isn't a clinic or a university. If Oliver knew at least the man's last name, it would simplify the task many times over. But no. Sleep. 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 He said to himself. What's the use of guessing without the slightest clue? So Oliver surrendered to the mercy of Morpheus. Oliver promptly served two tables and went to the kitchen for a cup of coffee. But no sooner had he reached the kitchen than a well-groomed, expensively dressed, but disheveled lady entered the restaurant. She was followed by a respectable man with gold-rimmed glasses and a crocodile-skin suitcase. If he sold it, he could buy a decent domestic car. Hello? Molly, the receptionist, smiled broadly and answered. Do you have an order? Never again in my life. Cut off the lady and told to call the chief. Mia is out of town, Molly said with the same dazzling smile. But perhaps I can help you. The woman glared at her and finally condescended. Well, maybe. That's fine then. Continuing to stretch her lips in a smile, the receptionist said, Please come into my office. The visitors followed Molly out, leaving the staff present wondering who they were and what they wanted. Soon they all found out. After about 20 minutes, Molly came out into the hall and told everyone to go to her office. The lady turned out to be the spouse of the restaurant patrons who had been poisoned by the rattlesnake mixture, and the man was a family lawyer. The woman looked angrily at the staff and said, I've heard rumors that this place drains the remnants of alcohol and serve customers under the guise of cocktails and even wine. In addition, you serve the leftovers of what the previous customer was fed up with. Where did you get this information? Olivia, the waitress, asked incredulously. To avoid leaking information, I do not disclose my sources. Pressed her lips, cut off the wife of the victim. Until the trial. But maybe we can settle the case amicably? A pale Molly inquired. How would that be? My husband has an ulcer, and he's in critical condition. And medicine and stay in a private clinic costs a lot of money. Why is he drinking alcohol with an ulcer? Oliver thought. In this case, we could raise money and pay for the treatment of your husband. 
generously suggested the administrator. Kate, maybe it makes sense to consider this proposal. The party offers to compensate you for the inconvenience without any trial, and if I'm not mistaken, is ready to do it immediately, said the family lawyer, and, turning to Molly, clarified, did I understand you correctly? The administrator was relieved, and she replied, that's right, the restaurant is ready to do it immediately. The money will be there tomorrow morning. Is that okay with you? Why not right now? The lady was obviously trying to get her price up because I don't have access to the organization's accounts. The manager won't be in until tomorrow morning, Molly explained. All right, tomorrow it is. The woman turned from anger to grace. Then the incident can be considered over, the lawyer smiled. I'm sorry to bother you, but keep in mind, Kate said menacingly. If I don't have the money by tomorrow, I'm suing this diner. Okay, okay, the receptionist babbled. Oliver, don't you have anything to say? The receptionist stared at him. What am I supposed to say? He shrugged his shoulders but guessed what Molly was getting at. I'm not a snitch, if that's what you mean. But you've always resented us for poisoning the people, she said. Well, I was, Oliver confirmed. Yes, I was. I don't resent it anymore, do I? And besides, if I wanted to pawn off my co-workers, I wouldn't have let on that I had a problem with it. Actually, Molly thought, there was some common sense in what he was saying. You don't seem like the kind of man who would do anything to hurt someone. And if a man is in dire need of money, he'll put up with anything. Huh, David said skeptically. So, maybe you snitched quietly? And then you said that Vita wouldn't have done it? You're judging yourself, aren't you? Oliver grinned. I see you're getting talkative, the bartender said cockily. I know such honest loudmouths here for the sake of appearances. Like, look how honest and principled you are. And all transparent. I don't do anything under the radar. I say what I think. Oliver, realizing that he was being deliberately provoked, chose to remain silent. The administrator looked at the bartender and decided that his version had a right to exist. But what's the use of these fights? There are victims, there is his wife, who threatened the restaurant with a lawsuit. David did mix leftovers, and Oliver didn't like it. That's why he bailed on all of us. Or not. I don't care if you investigate. Okay, Molly summarized. No more moving. We divide the amount of the claim amongst all of us. Seems fair to me. What the hell's fair? The bartender grumbled. Somebody burned the whole place down. Pay everybody? Whatever. That's Oliver's job. Guys, what are you doing? Oliver exclaimed, realizing that this was getting serious. I wondered if it had something to do with that guy. What difference does it make? He thought, and tried to make some argument in his defense. Or they'd really have to pay that lady. I've never seen that lady before, he said. So what of it? Jack grinned. I've seen her. I haven't seen her. What's the internet for? Did you post an anonymous post or write a post? You rat, you're Oliver. Jack, calm down. Do you have any proof? No. But when you do, you'll be able to use that kind of language, the administrator said, seemingly oblivious to the fact that just a few minutes ago she'd been leaning that way herself. Oliver realized that Mary was looking at him both pityingly and squeamishly. So much for love. The bartender and the chef looked at Oliver disdainfully, as if he were not a man but a cow patty. Fuck all of you. He stormed out of the office. Now Oliver knew for sure that he was not going to work in this restaurant. He reached the staff room and caught his breath. For a second, Oliver wondered if he was doing the right thing. The right thing was the guy's decision, and when he made his decision, he felt an unprecedented lightness. Oliver left the room and he wanted to laugh out loud. From now on, he was no longer a part of this mess. And mom? Oh, he'll figure something out. How far are we going? Oliver heard the voice of the restaurant owner. Oh boy. Molly said she wouldn't be here until tomorrow. What difference did it make, really? It didn't matter to him anymore. Good morning, Mia. Oliver greeted her politely. She was wearing even more gold than last time. He wondered if she was afraid to go out alone at night. Morning. Mia nodded as if she were doing him a huge favor. So where were you heated? Home. She raised her eyebrows in surprise and a skid. Did anyone let you go? No. Looking at the boss in the ease, the guy shook his heed. But I'm not in slavery. Not slavery, agreed Mia. But if you want to quit, it must be done according to all the rules. That is, to write a letter of resignation. 
so let's go into my office. Oliver had no choice but to obey. God forbid she should make him pay the money to that woman, he thought. But nothing of the sort happened. Oliver, answer me honestly. Did you really not tell anyone about what you saw here? Mia asked. No, I didn't. Believe it or not, I had nothing to do with it. I'm not a snitch. I see. Deeply thoughtful, said the boss, handing Oliver a piece of paper. There's no judgment. What do you want me to write? She asked. What do you mean? Please fire me at my own request. And so on. In my name, of course. In case you didn't know. Yeah, 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 that's the pattern. Lady Boss pointed to Oliver's right and he saw a sample letter of resignation. Good for you. Looking at him intently, Mia said, signing the letter. Goodbye. Have a good day. And as he was leaving the restaurant building, he was literally nose to nose with the very customer who had offered him a job. So maybe this is fate? I'm sorry, Oliver said embarrassed, seeing the man rubbing his forehead. It's okay. You're working early today. I think it's just about right, the guy said thoughtfully. Something wrong? Well, you could say that. Oliver agreed. So, I guess I'll have to do without my favorite chicken pancakes today. The man grinned. You know what, kid? Let's go to that diner over there and you can tell me what happened. Well, that's what I figured, nodded the man, whose name was Thomas. He was the owner of five gas stations, and each of them had a diner. The diners were pretty good, by the way. So, Oliver, I'd like to offer you a job. I'm hiring for a newly opened diner. Oliver listened without interrupting. I realize you were making more money at Midi, but I have less running around to do. All you have to do is heat up a hamburger, a sandwich, or some other hot dish and serve it to the customer. In general, the work does not beat a man lying down. Tips as such a phenomenon is rare, but many visitors do not pick up the change can safely take yourself. Where do you live? When Oliver named the neighborhood and the street, Thomas splashed his hands. The diner is right next to your house. You'll cross the street and turn a little to the left. So, are you going to consider the offer? No, I'm not going to think about it. Oliver shook his head. All right. Well, thank you for listening. No, you don't understand. I'm fine with it, and I'd like to work for you. There's just one thing. What's that? I'm a part-time student, but I do come to lectures occasionally. And, of course, the sessions. Is that a problem? I'll let you go. I'm all about the schooling. Oliver remembered the words of the hiring manager at Medea's restaurant about Mia's respect for part-time students and mentally smiled. Hopefully things would turn out differently at the new job. When Oliver had told his mother that he thought the offer of a restaurant patron was worthy of consideration, he hadn't had much faith in it. There was hope, of course. But as Natalie had rightly pointed out, everyone wanted a bigger piece of the action. And poaching employees was a common practice so Oliver had been under no illusions at first. However, after a conversation with Thomas, he realized that there would be no such lawlessness as in Medea at the new place of work. In general, the offer turned out to be worthwhile and not just worthwhile. It turned out to be fateful. The decision that Oliver finally made changed his whole life. The job turned out to be, as Thomas put it, a cakewalk. The customers of the diner were car owners who wanted a quick bite to eat. There was no need to tiptoe in front of them, look into their mouths waiting for a tip. You placed your order and you were free to go. All food was served in disposable dishes which visitors threw away in a special container. Yes, there was less money, but the conscience was cleaner, which was important to Oliver. He had a great relationship with the staff, but Thomas was like a father to him, or an older friend. Oliver's attitude toward his boss had nothing to do with subservience. He simply respected the man without trying to get under his skin, and Thomas was returning the favor. I have plans for a restaurant, he told Oliver one day, and I've got serious plans for you. Just so you know, will you be the manager? The guy didn't know what to say. Of course, he saw that his boss made him stand out among the other employees, but such trust was even a little frightening. What if Oliver couldn't justify it? The skin of an unkilled bear, he grinned to himself. There's no restaurant yet. I'm already afraid of letting Thomas down. You don't think you can do it? Thomas had guessed his train of thought. Oh, come on. 
I've studied you for a year and I've come to the conclusion that a restaurant manager is what you need. Restaurant manager? Oliver marveled, not expecting such a turn. Administrator, hiring manager, but manager. Yes, Thomas nodded nonchalantly. We'll be open in a year, when you graduate. That's a job for you, by the way. Or do you have other plans for your life? Oliver had no specific plans for his life. He knew perfectly well that to get a job without experience was possible only through acquaintance. And here was an opportunity like this. A restaurant manager. No more, no less. Yeah. It was a dream come true. Are you serious? Oliver whistled seriously. No, I was making a sad joke. Oliver, are you asleep or something? Ironic, snickered the boss. Do you get it? I just realized. Well, I'm speechless. Thomas laughed merrily. Of course I'm serious. I'm working on opening a restaurant called Son of the Regiment. Sounds good to me. It's an interesting name, Oliver said with a smile. It's original. But there's nothing original about it, Thomas replied. I really was a son of the regiment. You were? How did you come to be the son of a regiment? Tell me. I wonder how. How? Boss said thoughtfully and sank into his memories. Then he, a seven-year-old boy, lost his parents after a terrible bombing. And when everything quieted down, sitting on the ruins of the house, I'm smearing tears on my cheeks. And suddenly I see a regiment of our Russian soldiers, Thomas recalled, looking somewhere past his interlocutor. They took me in. The soldiers brought little Thomas to the dugout, fed him, and gave him a drink. To lose relatives, and even at such an age, is very frightening. But among these big, strong, and kind uncles it was easier for the boy to endure his grief. I remember one of them especially. Thomas smiled and the wrinkles in his face miraculously relaxed. His name was Uncle Harry. He took care of me like I was his own, said he'd lost his son. A month later, Nazi Germany capitulated. The day before Uncle Harry was wounded and in the hospital, Thomas continued. I was put in an orphanage, and when I graduated I tried to find him. I had no idea if he had survived the wound, but what the hell. But alas, I made all the connections I could but to no avail. Harry's in town by the trailer load. He's probably not even alive anymore. That's a shame. Yeah, it's a shame, Oliver nodded. It's a shame. You know, I'm opening this restaurant in memory of those events, Thomas admitted. That's great, the boy said. A year passed. The opening of the restaurant Son of the Regiment, which took place on the eve of the new year, became a real holiday for the townspeople. A Toastmaster was invited to the banquet, who coped with his task on Five Plus. There was not a single bored face in the hall. On the occasion of the opening of the new owner of the institution dressed in a dark gray suit, snow-white shirt of the finest silk, complementing the outfit tie bow tie cornflower color and looked very imposing. Thomas, you look like a groom, Oliver complimented him. Well, you don't look too shabby either, Thomas replied in a satisfied voice. By the way, there's someone I want you to meet. His wife Lily stood next to them and smiled. If Oliver hadn't known that Mrs. Thomas was in her 70s, he wouldn't have believed it. In her youth, she had done a lot of gymnastics. In her older age, she had taken up aqua aerobics. Well, and now regularly visited the pool and respected the Russian bath. Therefore, Lily's figure could be the envy of 30-year-olds and black tight-fitting dress with an open shoulder, decorated with gold trim sat perfectly. Natalie and Kate were also present at the opening. The women looked at Oliver with pride and thanked fate for bringing him together with this wonderful man, the son of a regiment. Now Natalie remembered her illness as a terrible dream. Or rather, she tried not to think of it. The mother of the newly minted restaurant manager looked great, and the neighbor did not hit the dirt. On the eve of the event, both visited the hairdresser and went shopping. How do you like it here? Lovely ladies. Oliver asked with a social smile. Oh, it's wonderful, Kate exclaimed. Thank you so much for inviting me. The last time I went out was when Sam was still alive. Oliver remembered that his neighbor's husband had left the world when he graduated from high school. Well, he was happy to give this kind woman a party. I'm proud of you, restaurant manager. Sounds impressive, smiled Natalie. I like it too, Oliver replied proudly. He added importantly, 
Okay, lovely ladies, I have to get back to work. Please tell me what business, said his mother cheerfully. Otherwise, I have to learn a new position. The restaurant was starting the next day, and Oliver needed to give the chef some orders. He remembered walking into the kitchen of Medea's restaurant and seeing the bartender pouring drinks into a bottle. It had seemed like a short time ago, but it had been over a year. Everything in life is not fair, as if in reality he heard Mia's words. You're still young? You don't understand a lot of things. Oliver, you'll be honest but poor. The words of his colleagues at the restaurant came to mind. So what's up, gentlemen? Whose is it? Oliver thought triumphantly. He would work honestly. He'd heard that things weren't going well at Medea, but that was to be expected. You don't get far by cheating. That wouldn't happen in this restaurant, Oliver decided firmly as he opened the kitchen door. How's it going? He asked. Work, the chef reported. Well done. Oliver praised him and began to give orders. He felt important, needed, useful. He liked that feeling. Oliver was ready to work hard. It's a start, he thought excitedly as he walked back to the banquet hall. Suddenly, Oliver felt himself crash into something soft and fragrant. Then he heard the sound of an object falling, and when he finally woke up from his thoughts, he saw an unearthly creature right in front of him. The girl was so beautiful that Oliver wondered if he was dreaming. She looked like a princess from a fairy tale, like a fairy. Well, they just don't exist in real life. I'm sorry, I was thinking, Oliver muttered, and bent down to pick up a fallen object that turned out to be a miniature handbag. Here, thank you. The girl nodded with a slight smile. You're welcome. Machinally, he answered, continuing to look at the beautiful stranger. The girl's long hair resembled sun-dried flax. Her lips, painted with a delicate pink gloss, brought to mind flower petals covered with morning dew, and her eyes were unreal, bright as summer skies, huge, framed by luxurious long dark lashes, a girl of summer. The words of a song came to mind. It seemed to Oliver that it was summer. No, it was late December when the scent of wildflowers suddenly wafted over him. It smells like summer, Oliver said. What? The girl said, surprised. It smells like summer, he repeated. Can't you smell it? Maybe, laughed the beauty. I love perfume that smells like wildflowers. Perfume. Oliver stretched out disappointedly. Uh-huh, replied the stranger cheerfully. And I thought you were the magician who brought summer. Oh my God, what am I talking about? Alas, the girl waved her hands. What is not given is not given. Oh, Thomas who had suddenly appeared with his wife, said with a smile, I see you two have already met. Goody, goody, goody. So you're the Oliver, the girl said, splashing her hands together. So you're May's granddaughter who went to Cambridge, in turn, Oliver guessed. Yes, such a beauty should have stayed there and become the wife of an English lord. But what kind of lord am I? I wonder what that old fox said. Well, it turns out you are the one, nodded flattered Oliver. And I'm May, the girl said simply, holding out her thin, well-groomed hand to him. Nice to meet you, he smiled. Shall we drink champagne to our acquaintance? Thomas proclaimed and made a sign to the waiter. A stout man in an expensive suit materialized out of nowhere. Next to him stood a pretty blonde woman who reminded Oliver vaguely of someone. And when it became clear that the man was Thomas's son and the blonde was his wife, he realized it was May's mother. Her name was Polly and her husband was William. Look, Natalie, what kind of people does our Oliver hang out with? Kate noticed. The guy's going to go far. He would, smiled Natalie. Kate's mom, come join us, Oliver called out. Let's go, shall we? She said to her friend. Let's go. In a minute, it seemed as if they had known each other for a thousand years. Boys and girls, I have an interesting suggestion for you, said Thomas. Let's celebrate New Year's Eve as a group. Unless, of course, you have plans of your own. Why? William smiled. I like the idea, and my wife has taken me up on it. Judging by the happy faces of the others, they liked the proposal. Well, that's great, Thomas summarized. Oliver, why don't you show me the restaurant? May suddenly said. That's a great idea, Grandpa said approvingly and smiled. Who but the manager knows the ins and outs of the restaurant? Well, let's go, Oliver said. They would make a handsome couple, 
Thomas said with a smile. Oh, Dad, you're so funny. William laughed. Maybe you should have opened a marriage agency instead of a restaurant. Although I don't mind having a son-in-law like that. Natalie was pleased that this respectable man spoke well of her son, and the girl was very nice. But, as you know, man assumes and God disposes. May said, looking around the interiors. Come on. I'm sure they have seen more than this in England, smiled Oliver. Why, England is good on a visit, but at home is better. Is it really so bad abroad? He teased. Banal, of course, but it is good where we are not. May said philosophically and suddenly asked, Oliver, do you mind using the first name? I just don't like these Chinese ceremonies. I'm all for it, Oliver assured her. They walked around the restaurant and chatted about everything. Truth be told, he didn't have much experience with the fairer sex. A couple of meaningless high school flings, a stormy, passionate affair his freshman year. Then an acquaintance at a party in his sophomore year, which grew into a new, it must be said, even more exciting relationship. But then his mother got sick, and Oliver didn't care about relationships. Easy, non-committal flings don't count. And now he seemed to have met someone who was really easy and good to be with. Oliver remembered the strange but at the same time incredibly exciting sensation that had possessed him. It was the first time he'd ever seen May and he'd never felt that way with any other girl. Love. Yes, I guess that's the one. May. What are you doing now? Oliver asked. Nothing yet. I'm studying business at Cambridge. I'm hoping to find something to do in the future. My grandfather promised to help me start my own business but nothing concrete yet. Anyway, we'll decide after New Year's Eve. Logical. The guy agreed. You know, I don't really like all these receptions, but now I wouldn't mind going back to the banquet hall, May said. And what is it that draws you there? I'm just hungry, she said with a childlike directness. To be honest, I'm hungry too, Oliver answered. And the young men burst into laughter. So what are we waiting for? The girl smiled. By the way, the grilled fish is really good. It is, he smiled back. Our cooks know what they're doing, so let's go. At the end of the feast, everyone received souvenirs and sweet gifts. I will be glad to see you in my restaurant, Thomas said goodbye. Well, let's say goodbye, said May with a smile. And Oliver realized that if he let her go so easily, he would be the last critic. After all, New Year's Eve was still a week away. That's a long time. Maybe I'll see you one of these days? Oliver suggested it. Why not? They agreed to meet the next day. Sit down, ma'am, Oliver said gallantly, opening the door to May's car. It's not a Mercedes, of course, but it'll be a breeze to get home. As long as the driver was a good one, the girl replied. Oliver's driving experience was less than a year, but he preferred to keep silent about it. Oliver was a good driver, though. This is for you, he said pulling out a gorgeous bouquet of wildflowers from the back seat. Thank you. Chuckles. How'd you know that? Guess what? That I like wildflowers. Elementary, Watson. Oliver grinned. Yesterday you said that you like perfume with the fragrance of wildflowers, so I thought that a bouquet of wildflowers would be nice too. That's just great. May assured me with a happy smile. I'm glad you like the flowers. Now let's go. Where are we going? We're going to the same restaurant. At the restaurant, they were waiting for a fancy table set for two. Transparent gel balloons floated in the air. It was a very spectacular sight. There wasn't a soul in the room except Oliver and May. Let's get some flowers, he said, unable to take his eyes off the girl. Oliver had never really believed in love at first sight, but I guess they say that miracles happen on New Year's Eve for a reason. He didn't doubt for a second that it was true love the one they wrote about in books and made movies, the one he'd dreamed of deep down. The air is soaked with romance, May thought. Oh my God, have I really fallen in love? Like any beautiful woman, she had a lot of admirers. In May's life, there was only one long relationship, but she quickly realized that she did not love this man, did not begin to deceive him, and the young people broke up. Then friends said that she went crazy, you bet. Marriage to the owner of a construction company promised May a permanent residence in England. A full, carefree, what's more, a beautiful life. 
She took it all and easily gave it all up. May just shrugged her shoulders. Oh no, the golden cage was not for May. Had she been trained in business for nothing? Wine? Oliver offered gallantly. Perhaps, the girl agreed, waking up from her memories. The wine was wonderfully sweet and slightly tart. May liked it. He's just guessing my preferences, she thought. Let's dance, Oliver smiled. I'd love to. When Oliver put his arm around May's waist, he felt as if the ground had floated away from under his feet, and now they were dancing in weightlessness. At that moment, there was only Oliver and May in the world, and this mysterious weightlessness. The girl's head was spinning, but it was a pleasant dizziness. May heard Oliver's whisper, and her heart sank in happy anticipation. I know it doesn't work like this, but I think I'm in love. You do? She asked with a smile. It doesn't seem like it. He shook his head. I don't think so. I fell in love like a schoolboy. I could say the same about myself, the girl replied quietly. Their lips met. The next few days before New Year's Eve were stressful for Oliver. A string of corporate events kept him busy, and he'd come home at midnight. Oliver and May had only seen each other a couple of times. The rest of the time they exchanged tender and very touching messages. Be patient. After New Year's Eve I'll be less busy and we'll be able to see each other more often. As agreed, they celebrated New Year's Eve in the same group. I want to spend the rest of my life with this girl. Oliver made a wish at the sound of the chimes. May made the same wish. Both Natalie and Kate and May's family were happy that their children had found each other. Something tells me that we'll be at the wedding soon, Thomas said with a smile as he watched the lovers dance slowly. The others were of the same opinion. May, marry me, said Oliver. Marry, she marveled. We've only known each other for a short time. I think that's enough, objected the boy who was in love with her. At least for you and me. I feel like I've found my girl. May didn't know what to say. She felt the same way. But proposing marriage after a week of dating is a bit much. You won't regret it. I'll be a good husband, Oliver said seriously. Well, I don't doubt that, she replied with a smile. But, but don't say anything else. You'll break my heart. I won't. Looking into his eyes, May shook her head and suddenly said, I agree. Engrossed in conversation, the young people did not notice that the song had already ended, and they talked in silence. It was only when the elders applauded that they looked at each other in embarrassment. Well, that's worth a drink, William said, pouring the champagne. How would you like to get away from here? Whispered Oliver to his new bride. Why not? Oliver rented an apartment on the next street over, so he didn't have to worry about getting a cab. Unfortunately, I can't offer you anything more than a rented apartment, but I promise to make it up to you, he said. I'm sure you will. And besides, together we are strength. May smiled. We are, Oliver echoed. Shall we continue the feast? We will. He took out a bottle of pink sparkling wine, fruit, and cuts of meat from the refrigerator and carried it into the room. Need a hand? May offered. Yes, as a matter of fact, everything is ready, Oliver answered, pulling out new flutes. Well, here's to us, he said with a smile, handing May a glass of wine. And I propose to drink to love, the girl said slowly, giving Oliver a tender look that was more eloquent than any words. A beautiful toast, he replied quietly. And they both, as if by magic, felt an incredible warmth coming from each other. They fell asleep in the morning. Oliver cradled his beloved gently in his arms, thinking that this was, without a doubt, the best New Year's Eve night of his life. The wedding was on Valentine's Day. I love you and I solemnly swear to be the best husband in the world, Oliver said after the newlyweds exchanged rings. And I solemnly vow to be the world's best wife, May replied. A couple of months later, the couple gave the family the good news. We're having a baby, May said a little embarrassed. When they were celebrating Polly's birthday, it was the best birthday present you ever gave me, exclaimed the culprit of the celebration, hugging her daughter. It comes out, I will become a great grandfather. Thomas, who was blushing not only from the drink but also from the excess of emotions, said, it comes out. Chorus confirmed granddaughter and son-in-law. A week later, Thomas Sr. called Oliver and May. I have a surprise for you, he said in a mysterious voice. I'll be there in an hour. Thomas arrived exactly one minute to the minute. 
In the old man's hands was a small box tied with a red bow and a folder of some kind. What is it? The granddaughter asked. So you open it and find out, grinned the elderly businessman. The box contained a bunch of keys. Keys, May said. Keys, Thomas confirmed with a smile. These are the keys to your apartment. Grandpa, I love you. The girl screamed and threw herself around his neck. Come on, you're going to strangle me, Thomas said with a laugh. I want to live to see my great-grandson or great-granddaughter born. You'll live for sure. I hope so, nodded the grandfather, and, opening a folder, said, Well, this is the relevant documentation. Sort it out. Oliver sat in his chair and looked at them thoughtfully. Oliver, what are you doing? May asked, surprised. Nothing. He waved his hand. But still, yes, it's awkward to accept such gifts. Oliver stood up a little and said, Thomas, as soon as I can, I'll start paying you. What? What are you babbling about? The boss squinted at me. Don't even think about it. As far as I'm concerned, you've already paid me more than enough. And most importantly, you made my granddaughter happy. So I consider this a reward for a valued employee. Well, as long as it's a reward. That's right. Well, you guys go see for yourselves. I gotta go. What do you mean? May was sad. You can't even drink tea. I baked a cake. And then we could all go away together. Some other time. Thomas waved his hands. Business. Harry's life was the last thing in the world that looked like a fairy tale. The old frontline soldier could only hope for a happy ending. In recent years, he dreaded the thought that the end was just around the corner. But what would happen to his granddaughter Kate? He and she were the only ones left in the world. What if something happened to him? From time to time, Harry thought of the boy they had taken in with the whole regiment. It had been many years, but he remembered that the boy's name was Thomas. Harry had come to love the boy as if he were his own. Harry's wife Anne died during childbirth, and he raised his son alone. Then the Nazis shelled the house where they lived. Besides Mike, Harry's mother was in the house. Mary having lost both mother and son in one day, the man became withdrawn, but... But why should I lose so much? In despair, he questioned. Besides, Harry subconsciously blamed himself for the death of his relatives. Not a day went by that Harry didn't torture himself with the thought that they were gone and he was alive. I wish I'd been in the house with them then. No, no, no. The thought crossed his mind. The man was eager to fight, hoping that he would soon join those he cared about. But God was in no hurry to call Harry to himself. It seemed to the man that nothing could melt his heart. But when Harry saw the crying boy, something in his soul turned over. Mike would be the same age now. Harry thought and he could physically feel his heart healing. He had taken care of that boy, in memory of his dead son. And just before victory day, Harry was wounded. He lay in the hospital thinking about Thomas. The man could not help but realize that he, like all children orphaned during the Great Patriotic War, was sent to an orphanage. He would be fine there, the soldier thought. And yet in Harry's soul there was hope that fate would still bring him together with this boy. After all, as you know, the earth is round. But alas. At the hospital, Harry took a fancy to a young nurse named Alice. To his indescribable joy the attraction was mutual, and it turned into love. He left the hospital as a groom. Harry and Alice were soulmates. Only one thing marred the couple's happiness. They had no children. The couple bypassed all the grandmothers they knew, what only potions and other horrors they did not advise. But everything was unsuccessful, and only one of them, ancient old woman Stepanita, who lived behind the forest, said, All you will have, and when you least of all will wait for it. The couple were afraid to believe it, but everything turned out just as old Stepanita had predicted. In the eighth year of their married life, they lost all hope of becoming parents. Alice felt sick. It's the fatty milk, Harry said sadly. I don't think it's the milk, Alice smiled. What else would it be? Alice frowned. You're so clueless, aren't you? She laughed. We'll have a little one. Oh, fuck you, Harry exclaimed incredulously. Suddenly he remembered the witch doctor's words. I realized that on the third day, but I was afraid to jinx it. Alice said, and the next day the couple went to town, and the doctor confirmed the pregnancy. Harry and Alice were over the moon. The future mother was 25 and at that time she was considered old. In addition, the pregnancy had not come for a long time, 
and the doctors insisted that Alice should go into labor. So she did. And in due time, they had a son, Andrew. The boy weighed four pounds, a real big boy. Unfortunately, God didn't give them any other children. But the couple tried not to be discouraged. The boy grew up a real beauty, studied well at school and was fond of sports. Andrew grew up, married a good girl, Pam, and the young gave them a son and granddaughter, Kate. It would seem that Harry could say with a clear conscience that he was a happy man, wealth and connections did not gain, did not travel abroad, did not live in mansions. But he had a loving wife, a wonderful son, a kind, friendly daughter-in-law, and a beautiful, clever granddaughter. But the Almighty suddenly decided to test Harry's strength again. When Kate finished her first year of college without a single C, parents decided to give their daughter a gift to take her to the sea. Well done, Harry said approvingly. The girl spent a year chewing on the granite of science. She's never seen the light of day. She deserved it. Who knew the trip would turn out to be a real tragedy? On the way to the airport, the family's car collided with a gas tanker. The driver and Andrew and Pam were killed on the spot. Kate was taken to the hospital in a serious condition, operated on, after which the girl fell into a coma. When Alice learned about the terrible accident, she had a heart attack. The elderly woman could not be saved. What the hell is this? Helplessly thought Harry, sitting at the table and looking at the portraits of his beloved wife, son, and daughter-in-law. I've never done anything bad to anyone. I used to live a peaceful life, but fate has once again handed me new losses. For what? For what? Tears ran down the grief-stricken old man's cheeks. Be strong, Harry, the neighbor said quietly. You have someone to live for. Yes, that's true. Kate was the only thing that kept him in this world, and he vowed to put his granddaughter back on her feet by all means. When the girl regained consciousness, she fell into a deep depression. Kate did not want to live. Not only had she lost her parents to her grandmother, but she was also crippled, and only her grandfather kept her alive. And then she had a series of surgeries. Your granddaughter has a good chance of recovery, the doctor said. But Harry nodded doom and gloom. The operation cost a lot of money, which the elderly frontline soldier never had. But for his granddaughter's sake, he was willing to borrow money from the devil himself. Surgery on a quota, of course, no one canceled, continued the doctor. But the queue you will have to wait for more than one year. Meanwhile, the sooner you do the operation, the better. So you understand. I'll try to raise the money, Harry said quietly. How much money are we talking about? The doctor typed the numbers on the calculator, and the hope of his granddaughter's recovery melted away like smoke. But Harry was a former soldier, and Russian soldiers don't give up without a fight. Grandpa. I can't walk anymore? Kate asked pitifully on the way home. We'll see about that, he replied belligerently. We'll fight another war. The war was not easy. Not without the help of neighbors, relatives, daughter-in-law, he managed to ensure that Kate was not taken to the state institution. Helpless state depressed the girl, but Harry little by little managed to set her up for victory. You are the granddaughter of a frontline soldier, and you should not give up, he said. Money for treatment was collected by the whole world, but the full amount was far away. A neighbor advised to apply to a charity fund, which they did, but soon regretted it. The world was not without good people, and the sums of money came in. But calls with questions like that did not try to work, or accusations of fraud upset and offended. I'm the front man, a fraud, Harry Boyles. Have I tried working? What do they understand? First go through what I went through, and then open your mouth. It's the kind of call that makes you feel down. But still the grandfather and granddaughter did not think to fall into despair, although it was terrible. And only the pillow knew how many tears the poor orphaned girl had shed. They talked a lot, and Kate thought what an interesting conversationalist her grandfather was. She thought that the old man had nothing to tell about his life. Harry told his granddaughter about the son of the regiment. It would be interesting to meet this boy, Kate thought sadly. After all, he, like me, lost his parents. With the boy, grinned the grandfather. Glad she was interested in something, it was a good sign. That boy is probably babysitting grandchildren by now. But I hadn't realized. One day when Harry and Kate went for a walk, 
they saw a horrifying scene of a pack of stray dogs surrounding a small, obviously abandoned striped kitten. This will not do, said the ex-front man, and grabbed a stick and rushed to the aid of the little one, shouted Harry and swung his improvised weapon. Having driven the dogs away, he crouched down and said to the kitten, Well, buddy, you're safe now. He's so small, Kate exclaimed. He's so cute. Let's take him for ourselves. Well, I'd like that, smiled the old man, and carefully taking the kitten, put him on his granddaughter's lap. We should buy him some milk, the girl said in a caring voice. Well, we should, Harry replied cheerfully. For some reason, he was sure that everything would be all right. The elderly man himself did not understand where such confidence came from, but there it was. This gray stray baby in the blink of an eye filled the girl's life with meaning and gave her joy. She'd had hamsters as a child, but Kate didn't remember being so fond of them. Maybe it was because I was just a little girl and didn't feel responsible for what I had tamed, Kate thought. And only later she realized that it was all about the opportunity to feel strong and care for someone, even if it was a kitten who turned out to be a boy. What should we name him? Kate said thoughtfully. Let's call him Talisman, Harry suggested. Talisman, it's nice. I knew you'd like it. He nodded, looking intently at his granddaughter. Kate took great pleasure in taking care of the kitten, and Harry had built him a cute little house out of plywood. What a mascot. Now we have a guy with a place to live, or else. Little things that make life easier and more interesting. That's great, of course, but in addition to them, there are some pressing problems. Money was in short supply, which meant we had to figure out how to earn it. Soon Harry got a job as a laborer in a restaurant. And you got hired, Kate said. Why wouldn't I? Don't look so old. I can still do a lot of things. Interesting name, by the way. Son of the regiment. Can you imagine? The old frontline soldier's eyes moistened. You probably remembered that boy, whispered her granddaughter. You understand? Harry smiled, ruffling her hair. Working at the restaurant was not difficult. It was Harry's job to unload the food and then he had to carry the crates, packages, and the rest of the trash out of the kitchen. Take it to the bin and you were free to go. The pay wasn't much, but he was fed and allowed to take home some provisions, which allowed him to put aside an extra penny for the operation. Thomas hardly ever went to the restaurant. With Oliver in charge, he was as confident in his granddaughter's spouse as he was in himself. Oliver never for a moment forgot about ways to earn extra money, so to speak. And he made sure that nothing like that ever happened, speaking of Medea. The other day, Oliver had met Mary, the cook, at the supermarket, and she had informed him that the restaurant was about to go under. Yeah, he said casually, filling a basket with exotic fruit. I'm sorry. Where are you now? I heard you went to work at the diner, a former co-worker asked. Well, if you heard, why do you ask? Oliver snorted. Why does it pay so much? Why does it pay so much? Mary grinned back, nodding at his basket. What they pay is all mine, Oliver replied condescendingly, and he couldn't resist revealing his cards to her. You have outdated information. At the moment, I am the manager of the restaurant son of the regiment. No way. The girl stretched out incredulously. If you don't want to believe it, don't believe it. Oliver shrugged. Come in sometime. We'll give you top-notch service. The seafood there is amazing. And no five beverage concoctions. Uh, do you need a chef? Alas, we're fully staffed. He's got his hands full. Do you know who said those things about you? Mary. I'm honestly not interested. Oliver replied. He almost laughed. Did the lady expect to get a place by her snitching? Well, they're all like that. A bunch of losers. Oliver thought contemptuously. And yet he decided to condescend. Well, I suppose it's old David out of jealousy. Am I right? And without waiting for an answer, Oliver rushed to the cash register. Oliver worked his ass off and demanded the same of his employees. He spared no one. You're a tough one. May said one day when she came to visit her husband and her friend Meg, who worked as a hiring manager. And she heard him harshly reprimanding a slow waiter. Not at all. He shrugged. I'm just demanding. I want people to do a good job. And do I demand a lot? No. But lately, May had begun to notice something unpleasant about him. Arrogance, most likely. Where did that come from? The young woman thought with horror. 
Where did the Oliver I'd fallen in love with at first sight go? She hadn't been to the restaurant often, but a few times was enough for her to realize it. One day, May overheard two employees saying some not-so-nice things about the manager. We know the type. The waiter snorted. Another stagnant man who had climbed out of the muck into the muck. This is just the case when you give a man a diplomat, and you'll realize what he's really like. The bartender echoed. May hurried away unnoticed and was determined to talk to her husband. However, she did not succeed. May, all later, Oliver shook his head. When she made an attempt to start a conversation, I have an urgent two-day business trip. The plane leaves at three in the morning. And gently stroking May's rounded belly, he added, I'm going to miss my girls very much. What to say? The strict or, as he said, demanding manager in the presence of his wife was like a silk. When the couple found out they were having a girl, they immediately came up with the name Kate. From then on, Oliver and May called their unborn daughter by her first name. Kate and I will really, really miss you too. She smiled, thinking, well, then so later. After all, a couple of days won't solve anything. When Oliver returned from his business trip, something happened that May thought was out of the question. The manager of the restaurant Son of Regiment returned from his business trip in a very agitated state. The negotiations had gone badly, the potential partners were clearly shadowing him, and Oliver decided that it was better not to have any dealings with them. However, the guys were persistent, and it couldn't help but irritate him. Looking at his watch, Oliver noted with annoyance that he didn't have time to go home, because he had an appointment at a restaurant with representatives of the supplier's company. The cab ride was long, which also made Oliver unhappy. And when he finally arrived at the restaurant, he literally turned green with anger as an old man collected the uneaten food from the table as if it was nothing special. What am I talking about? Oliver thought angrily. It's really no big deal to people like that. The manager remembered that the old man had been hired as a laborer. He was fed like the rest of the staff. He also picked up leftovers. The partners were supposed to arrive any minute. Good afternoon, Oliver greeted the handyman dryly. Hello, the older man said with a polite smile. But when he saw the look in his eyes, he shrank back. May I ask what you're doing? It's me, Harry said in a humiliated tone. I'm on my way. I have a granddaughter. Well, I'm and I'm allowed by the boys, but if you can't, I leave the premises immediately, Oliver said softly but firmly. You're making me look like an almshouse. The bartender hid his eyes. He was embarrassed. The waitress Olivia wiped the table for the tenth time, but she didn't dare to leave the room. It seemed to her that if she made a single move, she would immediately get caught in the act. What are you standing there for? Help the man find a way out, Oliver shouted to the guard. Mike, who, like his colleagues, was terribly uncomfortable, took a hesitant step toward Harry, but he said with dignity, There's no need for that. I know where the exit is, and walked out of the restaurant. The bag of leftovers was still lying on the table. Who did you leave this for? Oliver asked someone unknown, looking squeamishly at the bag. The elderly veteran walked out of the restaurant. The guard caught up with him. Harry, take it away, said Mike. The guy was ready to fail from shame. He, like everyone else, fell in love with this man, to whose share fell a no-nonsense ordeal. He wanted to refuse, but remembering that there was not even bread in the house. And then Kate was so fond of calamari. Thank you, Mike, said the front man in a squeezed voice and went away. Meanwhile, May was talking to Meg's manager. May, I understand, of course. Oliver's a manager and all. But his behavior today is out of line, Meg said indignantly. The man, well, he's been through enough as it is. And your husband. Honestly, when I looked at the camera, I cried. What happened? And the hiring manager told May what happened. So, she said after listening to her friend, you're right. Oh, Meg, he wasn't like this a while ago. Oliver, what do you think you're doing? May said bitterly as soon as Oliver stepped into the apartment. What are you talking about? He asked, rubbing his temples. What a day we've had today. First this pointless business trip, then the force majeure with the suppliers, and then I hurt my grandfather for nothing. Idiot. About how you treated a man who went through the war, lost relatives, and now takes care of a paralyzed granddaughter. The wife replied in an icy voice and takes food from the table to feed the poor girl. May I, Oliver, what have you become? May asked in despair. 
Do you really think that if you are kinder to people, they will work worse? After all, I fell in love with a kind guy with a great sense of humor, not a pouty boo. And what did this old man do that was so criminal? Well, he picked up the leftovers from the table. So what? Did he take the last of it from you? I realized I was overreacting. I'm going to find that grandpa tomorrow and apologize. Well, that's better. May was relieved. Harry didn't show up for work the next day. Oliver had been waiting for him like manna from heaven. But the front man never showed up. He didn't show up for work, Oliver told May when she called to see how things were going. And rightly so. Pouncing on an old man is, you know, May, he pleaded. I'll shut up. When it became clear to Oliver that Harry wasn't coming, he went to Meg. Why do you need his address? The manager shrugged. He was a handyman, no employment. Worked it off, got it. Right. Oliver replied in a beaten voice, thinking that it might be a good idea to introduce official employment for casual laborers and part-time workers. Grandpa, why didn't you work at the restaurant? Kate asked. Harry's heart sank at the mention of the restaurant, but for him to tell his granddaughter about his humiliation, it was just a temporary job. I see, she nodded at his words. May loved walking in the park, and even the fact that September was cold and dreary didn't shake her plans for a second. Nature has no bad weather, she told her husband, and the off-season is my weakness. Well, let her walk, if she likes the fresh air so much. It is in Africa fresh air, Oliver thought fondly, though the people of Africa would not be so happy about such a promenade. But he had a day of work ahead of him, as usual. After taking care of the day's business, Oliver decided to have a cup of coffee and headed for the kitchen. Suddenly he stopped in the middle of the office. Oliver never realized where the misgiving had come from. It was right there. Delirium, Oliver decided. I'm just tired, and I'm upset about the handyman thing. What could possibly go wrong? May's out for a walk, May. He dialed his wife's number and when he didn't hear her voice he got really nervous. But maybe May had already come home and decided to take a bath. Why am I torturing myself? She'd see the missed call and call back. With that thought, Oliver went down to the kitchen and asked for a cup of espresso. I think that's enough for today, May thought and headed towards the house. Doll, slow down. The young woman heard a voice and turned back. Behind her stood three thugs, who smelled of alcohol and some other unpleasant odor. May turned away and walked faster. Where are you going? shouted another Gopnik, grabbing her by the strap of her bag. To get acquainted and preferably closer, a third added in a lewd tone. I'm not going to get acquainted with anyone, cut off the young woman, trying to free her purse. But she failed to do so. The gruff man flicked the strap with a folding knife and the bag opened. Give me the bag. No, laughed the one who wanted to get acquainted and grabbed her by her half coat. Guys, so it is that. What is that? Pusataya. So what? He hummed and pulled May to him. She tried to break free, but the thug held her as if in a vice. Suddenly a sharp pain pierced her lower abdomen and a pale May whispered, It hurts. What's that? It was as if she heard through absorbent cotton. She's driving. What if she's not? Let's get out of here. She's got a pretty good cell phone. May felt herself falling, but there was no more strength to resist. Harry was on his way back from his new part-time job dead tired. He was now a janitor at the store. It wasn't like a restaurant, but at least he wasn't humiliated. Oh my God! An elderly man exclaimed when he saw a blonde-haired girl in a crimson coat lying on the ground. Who's the one who did this to you? Harry leaned over to the blonde girl. Breathing, he stated. Next to the girl lay a cut-up bag, from which some documents were visible, an individualized pregnancy card. Harry read, pulling one out. The mother is honest. A pregnant woman was attacked in broad daylight. What the hell is this doing? Harry picked up the girl and slung her over his shoulder as he had carried wounded comrades to the bench. Be patient, sweetheart. He spoke softly and looked in her purse for her cell phone. There was no cell phone, and Harry was finally convinced that the girl had been robbed. Bastards. He threw his cell phone out in frustration. Hello? I need an ambulance. When Oliver heard the phone ring, he thought he was going to faint in a second, but he didn't. Your wife is in the Fifth City Hospital, said a woman's voice. Is she all right? Breathless, Oliver asked. You see, she's about to give birth. 
your wife's life and the baby's life are out of danger. But if it wasn't for the help of a passerby, there's no telling how it would have ended, the doctor reassured him. Oliver ran out of the restaurant without remembering himself. His hands were shaking so badly that he couldn't open the car. No, this isn't going to work. Oliver heard Meg's voice. Let's take my car. He looked gratefully at the manager and obeyed. You, Oliver exclaimed when he saw Harry. And this man helped your wife, said the doctor. And Oliver, without saying a word, fell on his knees before the front man and began to kiss his hands. You'll forgive me, Oliver said. I'm sorry. I don't know what came over me. I owe you one. What do you want? I do everything for you. Stand up, Harry replied with a sad, kind smile. Forgiveness asked for. It will be. So the younger generation hasn't lost themselves yet. What's wrong with my granddaughter? Thomas's voice rang out as he saw Oliver kneeling in front of an unfamiliar older man. Astonished, he asked, what on earth is going on here anyway? As Thomas gazed into the old man's face, however, he was at a loss for words. He would have recognized that sad smile and kind eyes of a man who was ready to help anyone who needed it from a thousand. And even though his hair had turned white and his face was covered with wrinkles, the expression in his eyes hadn't changed a bit. Uncle Harry? Thomas said in astonishment. Do I know you? Harry asked. We do. Thomas nodded, his eyes gleaming slyly. I am a son of the regiment. My name is Thomas. Thomas? Harry exclaimed, and the men hugged each other tightly. They laughed and cried, completely forgetting where and on what occasion they were. Oliver, said Thomas laughing. That old devil is the very same Uncle Harry. Oliver, on the other hand, turned as red as cancer. They were all on their way back from the hospital together. Thomas, I'm paying for the operation myself, Oliver stated flatly. It's not up for discussion. I insulted him. If I don't make it up to him, I'll never sleep again. I get it. I'm out of here. Thomas raised his hands. You're a good boy. You know how to admit when you're wrong. Not many young people do that these days. So few young people. Oliver said doubtfully. Believe me, I know what I'm talking about now, because the ringing of Oliver's cell phone prevented the old man from finishing his thought. It was May. Oliver, I think I'm in labor, she said in a strange voice. What? he exclaimed, jumping up on the table like a scalded man. Honey, I'm on my way. Do you remember what they said in class? Deep breaths. Daddy, where's your mask? the midwife asked sternly. My bad. Oliver answered cheerfully, taking the mask out of his pocket and turned to his wife. How are you, Bunny? I'm a hippopotamus, May complained. It's all right. It'll all be over soon, and you'll be just as graceful. Smiled at the young father. Even more graceful. While May gave new life, Oliver held his wife's hand and gazed tenderly into her eyes. It was an incredibly touching sight. And when the baby girl's crying sounded, Tears of happiness spurted from the eyes of the new parents. It's a daughter, our daughter, repeated the happy father. May, I love you. I love you. And two weeks after the joyous event, Kate, accompanied by her grandfather and son of the regiment, flew to Germany. The operation had been a success. Of course, there was a course of rehabilitation ahead. But the most important thing was already done. I can't wait until I start walking again, the girl said when the trio sat in the gazebo of the hospital yard and sipped aromatic non-alcoholic mulled wine. And not only to walk, but also to dance. The reviews are encouraging, and our doctors had given her a promising prognosis. Thomas had encouraged her. So cheer up, beautiful. Mark my words, soon all the boys will be yours. I wonder how the mascot is doing. Kate sighed. I miss it so much. Well, my Lily won't let him get hurt. She's my animal lover. All three of them laughed happily and clinked cups of mulled wine. Two years later, little Kate's christening was celebrated at the son of the regiment. Could there have been any other options? When Oliver and May had suggested Harry as godfather, he'd wept. I'd be honored, said the front man. But I'm very old. Godparents are for what? In case the parents leave suddenly, there's someone to take care of the child. And I don't have long to live. Oh, come on, you're not long enough. And we'll take care of Kate ourselves, because we're not going to die in the next hundred years. 
but you're our godparents because you're like our family guardian angel. Kind of, May laughed. Well, Oliver, you're no poet. But seriously, you really are like a guardian angel to us. First you took my grandfather in, and now you've saved me. Yeah, I consider that day my second birthday. Anyway, I couldn't think of a better godparent. And Harry thought about how unpredictable life is. He'd lost everyone except his granddaughter Kate. But he'd found people who were family. Kate's godmother was Meg. To be the godmother of the man who kept my boss from going missing and saved my friend's life? That's really cool, she said when she found out who would be the cutie's godparent. Kate came to the christening with her young man, whose name was Tim. The guy studied at the same institute as her, only older by a course. The girl did not hide the fact that Harry's grandfather looked with interest at the friend of the mother of the restaurant manager. By the way, a kind, pretty aunt. She was also her namesake. Natalie's personal life had also changed. When she finally recovered from the disease and decided to engage in floristry, Oliver helped his parents to open a salon. And at the presentation, Natalie met with her son's business partner, who was a widower, and he offered her to formalize the relationship. I am a responsible man, and I do not intend to live in sin. He too had been invited to the christening, and now sat next to Natalie with such a proud look that Oliver couldn't help laughing at him. So much for business partner. Now we'll have a family contracting business. Mike, William, and Polly looked lovingly at their daughter and granddaughter. They had often expressed regret lately that they had not given May a sibling. They remembered Thomas or Lily saying that May would grow up to be selfish. Though their fears were in vain, Polly and William often looked back. May had married, and they missed having someone to care for. May sat in her mother's arms and gawked at the adults with curious blue eyes. You are under God's protection now, May whispered. And Oliver looked at those present and thought about how different they were. Each of them had his own complicated and, most importantly, uninteresting story.